Uh, okay, good morning. So we are supposed to talk a little bit about more advanced mathematics. So I call the transition to advanced mathematics. Uh, mainly today, it's an informal session. I just want to talk about what we mean by abstraction, because that's the main tool in the hand of a mathematician uh, to think abstractly about the concepts. Of course, abstraction is not something uh, that you are not unfamiliar with. So you are, you are not familiar with because, for example, I don't know, uh, when we are born and then our brain starts uh, scanning things around us and then we cannot digest all possible information we receive from our uh, senses. So we have to sometimes abstract things out. For example, if I want to give you a simple example, people can, uh, I don't know, cook pasta. Yes. But what is the recipe of pasta? The recipe of pasta is some kind of abstraction. Because for example, you say that, okay, you boil the water and put pasta in it, wait 10 minutes and take it and eat it. Okay, if you see that there are a lot of information that you're actually foregoing, you don't care about them or overlooking them. So you don't care about what is the real shape of pasta or, uh, what kind of instrument you are going to use to boil your water. So that is somehow an abstraction. So uh, if you, you know somehow that if you follow this abstract recipe, then you will not be hungry anymore. So you have your pasta ready and you can eat it. Um, so this abstraction is something that we really are used to it. Okay, but when it comes to mathematics, I don't know, for some reason, it seems a little bit strange, okay? And I want you to learn and try to enjoy the art of abstraction, which I think is important if you want to do mathematics. Because you know that we have, we can say that we have two types of mathematics. One is concrete mathematics, and the other which we call abstract mathematics. Some mathematicians mainly work in the realm of concrete mathematics. Some mathematicians prefer to work in the world of abstract mathematics. <laughs> it depends which one you prefer. But even those people working in concrete mathematics, they know a lot of abstraction ideas behind their head. Because what, what do I mean by concrete mathematics? For example, I don't know, you have a loan from the bank, you want to calculate how much you owe based on the interest rate there, okay? So that is a mathematics that is going to solve a problem from your daily basis life, okay? So that's a, you have a problem in real life and then you apply mathematics to solve that real problem. Of course, I'm not underestimating the role of concrete mathematics. The concrete mathematics could be really, really technical if you want to solve hard problems. For example, I don't know, if might be you are a physicist and then you want to send an electromagnetic wave from one point to the other point. So then you have to deal with a lot of very abstract, not abstract, a lot of formidable equations called Maxwell's equations. And then you should be able to come up with some idea how to solve that particular problem uh, so that it is, it, it, it will enable you to send this electromagnetic wave from one point in space to the other point. But if you ask that person who is working on the problem, what is your goal? The goal of the problem is actually very clear. I want to solve this problem to enable me to do this job. Okay. Uh, but in abstract mathematics, we are actually doing the same thing that we do on daily basis, like, like cooking pasta. We try to forget about as much information as possible and try to see the core of the concepts and ideas and to see if we can say about that property and investigate that property a little bit more. That's the idea of abstract mathematics. Uh, abstractness, abstraction, yes. So, but let me, for example, give you an example. If I want to give you an idea what abstraction uh, more or less like. So for example, assume that you have some objects I don't know, for example, you have one object. This object has some properties associated with it. Uh, for example, let me call that property. They are just <laughs> abstract objects. Whatever you want, you can think about them. I don't know, you can think it's a, a razor, a whiteboard, whatever. 
So, and then you have some properties for this one. So, so let, let us say that this object has property A, property B, and property C, and I don't know, property B. And then you have a totally different object, yes, with different properties. For example, I have Z, I have X, I have B, and I have, for example, L, yes. So these two things might be totally different objects, okay? But you, if you look closer, then for example, you see that you can find some commonalities between them. You see that property B is being shared between them. Okay, so this is somehow, if you are an abstract mathematician, you think, okay, this is an object in real life. This is another object in real life, but let me try to see, let me try to imagine a world, a world in which I have objects that have actually enjoying only one single property and that is property B. Okay, so might be you can really find an object which contains only one property in the world, but might be you are not able to do that. But what is happening is that you start, you start to imagine a world in which you have some objects that are enjoying only one property and that is property B. I'm just trying to give you an idea of what's the meaning of abstraction, okay? And I will give you more technical examples a little bit later. Okay, and then you try to study uh, this property as much as you can. And by the way, if you're a mathematician, if you ask why you are studying, they probably they don't answer that much. So they enjoy trying to dig into it and try to understand the properties coming out based on property B. Okay. So this advantage of abstractness is that you are living somehow in an imaginary world, okay? Because might be there are no objects which have one single property B that you can apply your theory to. This might be a disadvantage, okay? But this depends how you look at life. So that's, that's a personal thing probably. But what is the advantage? What do you think would be advantage if you study things in this way, yeah? Could it be that maybe in the future we, we find some sort of application for Yeah, that is really true. So this is usually the case. For example, you know that the very close brother to mathematics is physics. So many physics is many mathematics is being motivated by answering physics questions. Okay. But usually mathematics is ahead of physics. So it might be the idea of higher dimensions were very well known to a mathematician even before the 20th century. Okay, so they were talking about, for example, di uh, different dimensions, higher dimensions. I will talk a little bit about this idea, might be uh, a little bit later. But then uh, there was no physical application for that. Yeah, I mean, in the mind of a physicist, why you should be even interested in a little bit more dimensions than three? Because ap apparently what perceived in front of us is a world with three dimensions, yes? Okay, so why we should be even interested in looking for fourth dimension, fifth dimensions, and even higher dimensions. And then, by the way, mathematicians think in that way. When they want to talk about higher dimensions, they don't go for, from three to four, from four to five. They say that, okay, let us go to n dimensions. And then, of course, it is good. Why? If you can solve some problems in them n dimensions, if you have the theory that talks about n dimensions, what is the good point about it? The bad thing we discussed a little bit might be this, I don't know, 10 dimensional world does not exist at all. So why we are bothering about thinking about it. Okay, so this might be a disadvantage. So you are somehow living in your own world, okay, of abstractness. And by the way, this is not very strange. Have you seen paintings, abstract paintings? So for example, sometimes you have a representative painting so if I should like, like Bob Ross, I've, sometimes he teaches how to draw landscapes with this uh, paintings and things like that. Okay, so when you look at the painting at the end, you see everything, okay? This thing represents the mountain, this thing represents the tree, this represents the river. But for example, if you go to Van Gogh, okay, it might be it's a little bit more abstract. So you need to dig into it a little bit. Of course, when you see some of the paintings, you can see you can visualize a person there, but it is not as clear as you draw a person really in front of you. And then you have some abstract art. I don't know, have you seen those kinds of arts? So people gather around and then stare at the painting 
And then you really don't know what is inside that painting because it seems that it is a random just colors and dimensions and things like that. So I mean, that is also the notion of abstractness, by the way, is very common in art. Okay, so it's not that strange. Uh, okay, so that was uh, what Rocco mentioned is right. So might be in the future we get an application and it has been proven to be like this, at least in the history of science, mathematics and physics, for example. Okay, and then another thing is that what? So it might be in the future we get an application, but it's still even at the moment, at the right time, it might have some uh, applicability why this is good to have this abstraction and my mainly i think this is what is driving mathematicians to abstract things out so let me just review so for example here you have an object with some properties one property is b you have another object with some other properties, but one property is again B. You, if you look around, you might be, you get different objects with at least one property B. And then in your own imaginary world, you have already thought about this property in detail. So what happens? It means that you have a ready-made theory so that if you have an object with that property, you can immediately apply your theory to that object from that perspective. Okay, and then you can apply your theory to this object from again the, this perspective, only considering B. So from now on, if you have any object that has some kind of this property B, what you have discovered for your own world is immediately applicable to this situation. So that's also one advantage of abstraction. Uh, for example, let me give you a concrete example. For example, I don't know. Uh, you have an orange, it's a fruit you can eat and enjoy, and then you have a basketball. Okay, so that's a different object. But if you think you can find some commonality there, so what is that commonality here? The roundness. So the roundness is a commonality between orange and a basketball, which are really two different objects. So if you're an abstract mathematician, you think, okay, let me abstract the notion of roundness and try to study roundness, okay? And if I have another object which is round in the same, in the same sense, then I can immediately see that I can understand those roundness properties that I have studied in my theory. And this gives rise to the definition, an abstract definition in mathematics. What is that? It's roundness. What is that abstract object? No, no, it's a, a ball is different in mathematics, by the way. Yes, uh, the roundness, like uh, orange and ball, are not called circles. But we, by the way, we have a good unification of these concepts yeah. a little bit later. So it's a sphere. It's a sphere. So you actually, you say that, okay, this roundness, let me give it a name. I don't know who gave it a name of a sphere or what a sphere means. But you can just say that this, I call it a sphere. And then I want to study the property of this sphere. By the way, a sphere is really an abstract object. It doesn't exist in real world. How can you see that this is? A, because when you, say, when you say sphere, it means that what is the thickness of the sphere? I mean, if you have an orange, you can peel it off. You have a thickness. That's not a sphere because that is a represented, uh, representation of a sphere. So what a sphere is is just really an abstract object just in living in your head and in your imagination. Because the real abstract sphere does not have any thickness at all. So the thickness is zero. So this is the abstraction behind the sphere. And by the way, we are not able to show that an object is a sphere. Why is that? If I give you a basketball, in principle, from a mathematician point of view, you cannot prove that that's a sphere. Uh, because by the way, what is a sphere? Can you now, do you remember? What is a sphere? If you want to have a definition for your sphere a, as an abstract object, what do you say a sphere is? Yes. So if you consider like a center of points, yeah. and then you consider a bunch of points that are equal in distance. distance. Yeah, and it means that, that, yeah, exactly. It is the location of all points in the space that are equidistant from a fixed location in the space. So that's called a sphere. 
And if I want, if I show you a ball and I ask you prove this ball is a sphere, to, to be honest, there is no way for that. Because if I want to prove it, what should I do? Okay, I need to first of all locate the center. Assume that I did, I was able to do that. But then what I need to do, I need to connect that point to one point on the, sphere, on the ball and measure it. And then do it for the next one, do it for the next one, do it for the next one. But how many points are there to measure? Infinitely many. So that's one practicality. So we cannot prove that the ball is a sphere. In this, in a mathematical sense. Yeah, if if you can show that, okay, that's a good idea. And then another problem is what is what is another problem? So uh, uh, except for infinity, yeah. Uh, no thickness. Yes, I am. I agree with you. But I mean that if I give you something in the physical world and I sh ask you to show that this is sphere. One practical problem is that I cannot do this measurement infinitely many times. You don't have access to the center. Yeah, let us assume that someone gives us the center, okay? But I, that, that is another problem, that that's the problem of measurement, okay? So you cannot say that I measure the length of the radius with 100% accuracy. Even if you live one million from now, measurement has some kind of error inherited to it yes so that's another problem okay let us put this aside so for example this orange and this basketball gave rise to an idea of a concept orange and the basketball are in our world in physical world looking at the roundness construct some kind of a concept in my head i abstract it out and put it on paper and I start discovering the properties of that idea. So that's one kind of abstraction. Yes, for example, let me tell you another idea. I don't know, I, uh, because my hands are tied here, so I cannot give a lot of uh, more advanced examples. But let me, for example, consider the rational, the set of rational numbers. You know the set of rational numbers are fractional numbers, so that the numerator and denominator are whole numbers, integers, okay? Uh, so if I want to define that, do you remember, we will talk about these kinds of ideas a lot in this course, that is set theory, okay? So we say that uh, the set, the, uh, this set of rational numbers is defined to be the set consisting of all fractions of this type, such that, so that is a symbol I use for saying such that, uh, if A and B belong, I have used this in my lessons a lot. So even from first grades, you are familiar with. So this means A and B belong to the set of integers. And of course, B is not equal to zero. Okay, so you know this. So instead of, yeah, let us imagine things. Let me, for example, in mathematics, instead of having a bag around numbers, we put them in curly brackets and call them sets. But let us, for example, say that I have the collection of these numbers okay for example i have one over two i have seven i have minus five i have i don't know three over five i have negative seven over ten and etc etc so these are the numbers is zero here or not is zero a rational number yes or no yeah zero is also a rational number yes because zero can be written as zero over one do you agree so this means that zero is an integer, yes? One is also an integer, one is not zero. So at least you see that zero over one is the same as zero. So zero is a rational number. So what I want you to do to throw that away, okay? Throw zero away from this. And this is usually the symbol we use. Don't get distracted by the notations and symbols I'm using. It's not confusing. For example, if you go to Egypt, you see a little bit of weird, handwritings there you're not surprised you're not confused you know that that has some meanings to those symbols that's it so if you know someone they can translate it for you then it is not that mysterious so that's the same thing i'm just using symbols okay so i have a collection of objects here the rational numbers but i have excluded zero from it okay and let me go to the other world here let us look at the world of vectors Okay, so vectors, I have a vector, this is an arrow, I call it a vector A, and I have another arrow here, I call it vector B. I don't know, I have another, so for example, here, vector C, et cetera, et cetera. So these objects apparently does not have something in common. 
Yes, that is the collection of numbers. That's a collection of geometrical objects, geometrical shapes, yes? Okay, now let me, yes, you are right. Probably there are no connection between them here. But let me apply an operation here. So let me define an, the usual multiplication operation, okay? And here I apply addition operation, okay? So, but here, but I just want you to know that this addition is an abuse of notation. This addition is not the normal addition that we learned in primary school adding numbers, yes? So if you don't mind, if, uh, if I want to be very strict, I have to use a different symbol for it because when I use this symbol on your calculator, what is the role of that symbol? symbol? It takes you two numbers and then when you press that button, it gives you another number. But here I don't mean that because I have two vectors I, in principle, I am not allowed to use the same symbol that I am using in a different context, yes? Okay, so let me just call it this one. But you know how to add the vectors, yes? And even if you are in the first grade, you know what to do that. I have a vector A, I want to add B to it. I will parallel transport it and put it here, and it becomes a B, and then I connect this one. So this is what is called A plus B, yes? Okay, now, now can you see commonalities here? I mean, before putting an operation on them, I had different objects. Apparently, even I couldn't see come some kind of commonality here. But now I put an uh, operation here, which is multiplication. Five times, seven times minus five minus 35. One over two times seven is 3.5, or et cetera. And then I put a, an operation addition here. Uh, so you know from your previous studies, what is the meaning of this? But now can you see some commonalities between this set of objects with this operation and this set of objects and that operation. Between the two. Yeah, I mean, so if I give you these and I ask you discover as many commonalities as you can. Somehow these commonalities should, should uh, connect how this operation is acting here on these objects and how this operation acts, or, or any one, you just be free. It might be, I cannot imagine, you can imagine better than me, we can discuss. Yes, Rasmus, for example, just give my one example. Exactly, so you see that here, this, I can apply it here, so I can write one over two times seven, yes, and I can write seven, this two. So you, from your studies, you know that there is no difference between them. Yes? There is no difference between these two. And the same thing is here. Of course, my objects are different. My operation are different. But what is common between this structure and that structure is more or less clear from this perspective. Do you agree that there is no difference between the order in which I add vectors? Yes? Do you agree? But this is something I don't want to repeat because this you know Okay, another commonality is what? Yes? Yeah, I mean, I, I can have more than two. Yeah. yeah, so for example, here, it doesn't matter if I multiply one over two. So for example, if I have this scenario, in principle, it should be confusing because it doesn't tell you which one to do first and which one second. But you know from your studies that there is no difference between the way that I group them, which is called associativity. And I don't know if you remember a little bit of vectors, that is also true here. So it really doesn't matter what I am doing here. Yes, okay. Another one is, for example, uh, there is a particular element here is somehow unique and distinguished. What is the element here? That is somehow distinguished. I don't know, might be, this is not a complete correct question, uh, but there is one element here that has some kind of neutral, being neutral property. Yes, what is that? No, no, just here, yes? One. One has a unique position here, yes? It doesn't matter which one of these numbers I take, 
I multiply it by one, I will not change it at all. So I will get the same thing back. For, I, I just want to write one example, you know that. Yes? Is there something in this world playing that role here? Yes? The zero vector. The zero vector playing the same role there. So if I have this one plus the zero vector, it becomes the same vector. Okay. And now another question is that there should be one way for me here to go back to one. For example, uh, is there any, if I choose any number from this collection, is there another number when this is multiplied by that, I go back to the neutral element? Yeah, it is two, yes? If I give you, so this is one. If I give you three over seven, what is the other one? This is called the reciprocal. Seven over three, that's also one. So it means that for every element that I pick there, there is another element so that when I do the operation, I go back to the neutral element, yes? So what can I do there? Is that possible to go back to the neutral element from a given element to you? Yeah, and that is called the inverse, I, I don't know, the negative of the vector. So it takes, so if I give you a vector, the negative of the vector is also an arrow, with the same length parallel to it in the opposite direction. And we know that if we add them, I go back to the neutral. So you see that even though these two structures were totally different, and still they are, but they have a lot of commonalities. And this happens that these properties that I mentioned here appears quite a lot in mathematics. So it might be some of you have studied set, um, matrix theory. So you see that if you have matrices, they're also following the same rules. And then we have a lot of structures following the same rules. So if you are a mathematician, there are two ways in front of you. A study each a structure individually. And if there are hundreds of structures having that property and somehow is interested to you, you have to study the whole individually. Or you say that, okay, let us give this commonality a name and make an abstract idea and concept out of it and try to study it so that in the future, if something is, uh, is something has that structure, then I have a ready-made theory so that I can immediately apply that. And but with that, by the way, there is a name for this, and that is called group theory. Okay, so group theory in mathematics is somehow studying the structures here. Group theory. Okay. So if I say is group theory studying rational numbers, the answer is no. It is not only the studying, is group theory, vector theory, no. Group theory is a framework which in which we work for, this, for the set of collections and operations enjoying these kinds of properties. That is, this gives me an idea of abstractness. So group theory is a really abstract subject. And the, the, in part, uh, uh, the branch of mathematics that has studied these things is really called abstract algebra. So because, yeah, you're just studying these ideas. So in group theory, uh, you need a collection of objects, here numbers, here vectors. In group theory, the collection of objects is usually called G for group, whatever it is. And then operations are not, so for, for being generic, you just say that, okay, I have a star as my operation. Yes? Something like this. This is an abstract idea coming from this. Is that clear? By the way, another powerful idea of abstraction I forgot to say is that it lives in your imagination. By the way, imagination is probably it goes even faster than the speed of light. For example, I close my eyes. I am in Mars now. Okay, I can imagine I am there. Yes, even a, a photon cannot compete with that in that case. So this imaginary world gives you that, okay, if you are good in imagination, you have a lot of structures in your hand in a, in a very strict way formalized, you can work on them and explore your imagination where it's going to take you, okay? So it, you can, because it is not possible if you do not have a unified picture in, your, in front of you, it's not that easy to combine. For example, if you have a theory, by the way, this is happening a lot, if you have a theory that prop studies property B on its own, and you have another theory, abstract theory, that studies property X, for example, and then might be in the real world, you cannot immediately find an object which contains both property X and B. 
but in an abstract world, you can combine them because you have the theory of them and then try to see what happens. And this is happening. We have branches of mathematics called algebraic geometry. So algebra is an abstract theory. Geometry is probably an abstract theory. And then people th start thinking, okay, can I combine these two? It was not that easy to combine numbers with shapes. Yes. But if you understand what is going on, you need to find a connection and then develop this theory. Yes. Mathematics, obviously, humans, they, they didn't they create a mathematics in that sense that they created how we think about mathematics. I think. But would you say that with how we operate on rational numbers and on vectors, it was kind of designed in a way such that they would enjoy probability specifically? Yeah. I don't know. This is a philosophical question. People, some people believe that we invent mathematics. Some people say that we discover mathematics. It's already there. We're just discovering that. Will we still like decide certain things about how we use mathematics? I mean, I mean, I guess there are ways in which we can be more easily like using uh, functions and graphs. Right? Mm -hmm. Like we 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 design how we make functions so that they can be written as a graph. In a sense, like you, I don't know. I feel like. Is mathematics designed in a way such that it's easier to, to like that multiple things in mathematics enjoy the same property? So that no, but I think we were not aware of this uh, this uh, overlap between different fields. So there was more discovery. Then. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At least we discover some connection between different lands of mathematics somehow. Yeah. yeah. I I guess to add to that, uh, you could say that we. Because like you could describe mathematics as like the study of problem solving is how I've heard it being described. So like maybe I'd say that we discover these properties and these things, but the way we express them, we have created. So like the way we write mathematics and the, the way we draw graphs, we we have invented and the, the properties and everything, and uh, um, that's something we discover. Even even in even if we invent that one, that is a little bit strange. You know that this is under debate, so that is unreasonable. This is, I think, one of the uh, Eugene Wigner famous article about unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. But somehow, it seems unreasonable because, for example, in the history of physics, for example. So you know about Albert Einstein. So so he was actually having a mathematical theory of gravitation. And that was very strange. So, of course, he started somehow inventing that structure for that framework. But then something strange happens. The theory was predicting, according when you solve the problems, then you get some solutions that shows that the universe is expanding. <laughs> and it was... It's strange to Albert Einstein because people didn't know that the universe is expanding at that time. Uh, so he was saying to, okay, don't be ridiculous, my theory, the universe is not expanding. And then he started manipulating manually and putting some terms in its in equation to prevent the universe from expanding. Okay. But later, when we discovered that, okay, the universe is really expanding, and he actually refers to this is one main blunder of his life to put this thing by hand. So the, the theory was crying, Albert, universe is expanding. He says, shut up, the universe is not expanding. You know? So I mean, this theory becomes a little bit more, sm I mean, smarter than he, the creator himself. Okay, so that is one idea. And then I think the other one is Dirac, actually by looking at the mathematics in quantum field theory and relativistic quantum mechanics, he was predicting that there should be a particle in the universe with the same mass, exactly the same mass of an electron, but opposite charge. But that particle haven't been discovered. I don't remember exact date, maybe 10 years later, people actually discovered, yes, that particle is really existing. So it means that the mathematics, we I don't know, is it invention or whatever, but it can predict something really real in the universe and then that particle is now called positron yeah so that's exactly the same copy of electron with the opposite electric charge so i mean uh, these are very interesting questions we can discuss about them uh, but let us not go very much because i want to finalize this idea of uh, abstraction 
uh, by a little bit different example. Uh, so, for example, you know what a circle is. I want you to see how abstraction can unify things. Okay. So, for example, you know a circle. So, what is a circle? So, a circle for you might be just a shape. Okay. So, something like this that I draw on board is a circle. By the way, these points are so, even though usually we put the dot there as a center, but the center is not included as the circle. So there is just that curve that you see. This is a circle. Okay, but let us make this idea a little bit more abstract. Okay, so what is a circle? To be honest, you have this space that is my whiteboard, it's a plane, and then I can look at this in a different way. You can see it as a shape, you usually do it in that way, but you can also see it as a collection of objects. But what are those objects here? You can call them points, okay? So that is a circle. So let me say, for example, if this circle has center O and radius length R, R is the number that I associate with that length, then I can say the circle C, whose center is O and its radius is R, one way is to imagine this object. One way is to write it abstractly as a collection of objects. And I told you that in mathematics, when we say collection, might be you imagine a bag, you put things in. But bag in mathematics is curly brackets. So you put things in. Okay, how can I define that? Okay, so if you don't mind, let me call this plane of the whiteboard plane P. Yes, so what I say is that this is a collection of points, but where these points are coming from? So I say that these are points like A, where they are belonging to, they are belonging, this means belongs to, the plane P. But I am not interested in all of them, so I have to put some constraint on it, such that, such that what? Are away from there. So the distance from this point to the center O is R. Okay? And let me use D for distance and say from A to O is what? R. Okay, which one is a circle? Is this one a circle or that one? For abstract mathematics, this is a better circle. Yes? Yeah, so that is exactly, by the way, when we are using words, when I say a dog, dog is, what is dog? It's just an abstraction of some creature outside. I write D-O-G for dog. Yes? Okay, which one is a better dog? I, I would prefer D-O-G because I can study properties of D-O-G by writing articles about dog without having to put the dog there in the article. Yes? Okay, so what happens here, this is a definition of this. But this, the power of this is the unifying power. Now, the space that I started with is plain. My claim is that if you go to the world of abstractness, a sphere is also a circle. But the space is different. The space is not a plane. The, the, the what can I say? The uh, the set of objects that I am working with is scattered through space, okay? So let me just try, instead of saying A belongs to P, let me say A belongs to S. S is my space, and this is space that we are living in, in mathematics is called Euclidean space. No, it's yeah, it's a sphere. I mean, the, I changed it. I didn't change the definition, you see? I changed this ingredient of my definition. I took it out, and instead of putting P there, I just put S there. What do you think it will generate? Well, let us read it again. This means that the same object, which I call it circle, is what is the collection of points where now, not on the plane, but on this another collection of objects, which is my space, so that the distance from those points in a space to this point O is equal to R. Can you imagine that this will generate a sphere for you? Is that right? Yes or no? Because here I, I have only, I have to choose my points from the whiteboard. Okay? 
But now when I say my points are in the space, I can also choose this point whose distance is R. I can also choose this point. I couldn't choose this point before because it is not on the plane. But now that I have relaxed that condition and I have gone to the one dimension higher, what happens is the same definition, the same definition generates now a sphere for me. So this is very powerful. So you can say that, okay, the idea of a circle and the idea of a sphere coming from the same kind of abstract definition. Yes? Is that clear? Let me test your understanding. What happens for the sphere, for this circle, when I go to one dimension? No, be careful. So let me, do you understand what I'm saying? So instead of saying P, P is the plane, yeah. S is the space, Euclidean space, uh, and then let me just write L for line, and this is my line. Okay, so let me just to clean that. And then what happens here, uh, for example, this is my line now, I call it L, and this is some point on the line O. And then I want to follow the same definition. It generates another sh geometrical shape. What that shape is? Yes? I don't know what is shape or not. Don't be so good there. Let us be humans here. We understand what one is. Two points. So that definition, because now I am not interested in points in plane or space. I am interested in all points A on this line whose distance to O is R. What are those points? So I go R units here. This is one point. And I go R unit there. That's another point. So this is my, this is my circle now. So this is the idea of abstraction. Might be, if before talking about these concepts, if you ask me to draw a circle, if I draw this one, you start laughing at me. But now I hope that you understand. No, they are unified under the same definition, abstract definition. Okay? Now, the power of mathematics, the power of abstraction is that if I ask you, I go to a dimension four. I go to a, some space, which is not Euclidean space, but I have four dimensions of a space. Okay? It is hard. It is not probably possible for our brain to understand what is this. Okay, but is do you think I can write something similar here? Well, I can write that. I can, I can call it. I don't know. I can call it. I uh, let me call it super plane, a super space, or something. And then I can just take P out and write A belongs to SS. Okay, but I cannot imagine the shape. But still, I can talk about the circle in one dimension higher. By the way, let me talk a little bit about dimensions. Dimensions is also abstraction. The reason that dimensions are sometimes, come, uh, sometimes it comes to the fictions because we are talking about the special dimensions. They are hard. But I can imaginarily go to higher dimensions. By the way, that's also a good idea. Let us try to unify the idea of dimension. So I have an intuition about what a dimension is. Yes? I know what the dimension is when I grow up, but then I want, to do, I want to define it in a way so that it can be extended over what I see and perceive. How can I understand that, okay? It's a little bit technical, but I can give you some idea. When I say that I am living in a three-dimensional space, what do I mean, actually? You need to, because this is, the, this is the art of abstraction, you need to see the core of the dimension. So one way of seeing the dimension is the degree of freedom you have, okay? So let us try to see, is that right? For example, in, if I am on a plane, if I am on a line, assume that an ant is going on and assume that this is really one dimensional object, then this, uh, this ant has one degree of freedom going left and right, okay? And now if I, put an ant here on the board, then it has two degrees of freedom. It can go left and right, but it can go up and down. But now if I have an ant or a fly in the space, it has three de uh, degrees of freedom, yes? Left and right, back and up and down, and also back and forth, okay? So if I consider the idea of dimension as degree of freedom, actually it's not that hard to imagine. And I can imagine, I can immediately go to higher dimensions. By the way, higher dimensions, extra spatial 
spatial. I hope that I'm pronouncing it perfectly fine. So a spatial, yes. Higher dimension, spatial, higher spatial dimensions are hard to perceive, but not higher dimensions. For example, assume that you are a physicist and you want to investigate the temperature and the pressure in this room. And you want to assign uh, something to every point in this room. So when you have a point in this room, it means that you already have three numbers associated to it. Yes? X, Y, and Z. Okay? So you put them here, X, Y, and Z. And for that point, you measure the temperature. You put a T here. And then for that point, you also uh, uh, measure the pressure. You put a P here. Okay? And then you are having these kinds of objects. This object is called a five tuple in mathematics. Okay? So the first three of them has dimension of length. For example, meter. And then this is Kelvin, for example, and this is Pascal. Okay? But this is an object in five dimensions. Because I can change these numbers independent of the others. So I can keep Y, Z, T, and P fixed but I can start changing X independent of the other ones. Yes? So that is, you see, that is not hard to imagine a five-dimensional space. So, for example, if you are sitting in this room and then you do this measurement, what do you collect? You collect a lot of five tuples. Yes? You measure that, I don't know, you go here, measure the temperature and pressure, and then you register it. It is one five-tuple. And then you do it somewhere else, you register it, and then put them in a bag. That is your space. The space of data. Yes? So that's the five dimensional space because you have somehow five degrees of freedom. So that's the idea of this. That's a good idea of this. So if you think that's an abstraction of the idea of dimensions. Okay, now let me ask you something. Uh, now, if you want to be a mathematician you think about okay let me try to understand the idea of circle not in these kinds of euclidean spaces or their subsets sub collections let me just put the idea of a circle in a really abstract space okay so my this is the idea that the people in mathematics think for example let me, I don't know, how can I write this? For example, my space is book, okay? I don't know, alpha, square root of five. Like, tell me some irrelevant things, yes? Star, and I don't know. You want to say something, yes, different. A dog is also a word, yeah? Pardon? It's, okay, I can draw it. <laughs> Yes. Okay. So now assume that this is your sphere. I mean, this is the mentality behind abstract mathematicians. They want to say, okay, I was able to unify this now. So I have an abstract idea of a circle, but let me implement it on this space. This is my universe now. So what I want to do, I want to draw a circle whose center is a smiley face and the radius is a one. What is the meaning of this? Okay? Okay, now let's try to practice this abstraction. You are, you put yourself in the shoe of that mathematician. What is the first thing that comes to your mind? Because there is a big difference still between these kinds of spaces when we grow up intuitively and this very, very abstract space. <laughs> so don't get confused. Mathematicians call all these things a space. Space in mathematics means a collection of objects with further structures on top. So forgive me about I'm abusing the notation. I don't know what to use, but let me just consider this space for the time being. Okay, I need something to be able to understand this creature here. The circle centered at the smiley face with radius one. Do you understand? This is a little bit odd in the beginning. Okay? You need an idea before doing that. And that's the idea. I, I want to teach you how to think abstractly. Yes, Rasmus, do you want to say something? Yeah. Can you say one word? Or a bunch of words, okay. Like, what, what 
this one is a Facebook one. You are close, but be precise in your words you are using. There is a there is a very common word. I mean, you know it because I feel it. Okay, so you are good in an abstraction. So what do we need? Think a little bit about that. If I want to not, let us review the definition. Do I need to reconsider this? This, this is the relation of belonging to. So I don't have any problems because book belongs to my collection. Notebook does not belong. So I don't need to do something about this part. Yes, that I can immediately. So let me give it a name. So let me, by the way, call it M, mysterious. Okay. And then I would say that C, uh, smiley face, and one is what? Write it. Write it for me, abstractly. You need not. Just write what? No, be careful. What is this A, by the way, here? It's a representative. I use it for showing a representation of my object. So what I write, I still write A. But instead of saying belonging to P, I say that belonging to M. And I say such that. And then C. I have to write distance between what? Between the smiley face. Uh, sorry. Between, no, respect everything, please. A, you have to respect, by the way, this is abstract mathematics. You need to put yourself in the shoe of a computer. Computer does not feel if you want to replace them, you have to tell it, okay? So that's exactly the same idea. So what, what should I write here? You see that this A is the same A, so I put it here. And then, and then, smiley face, yes? Do you see that? Yes, because now O is this O. Now O is occupied by smiley face, so I have to put a smiley face here and then equals to Y. Yes, that's my definition. Is that right? Yes, please. Um, this, this, um, so M is our replacement for P. Yes. M is a five-dimensional. It's, it's not five-dimensional. It contains one, two, three, four, five objects. But in, so what does that mean? Well, I don't know. <laughs> we want to give it a meaning. That's a, the idea of abstraction. Okay? Yes? So I'm thinking maybe to relax the fine further what this does. Exactly. What's the definition of the exactly. And that was what you were trying to say. That's the word that I was looking for. Because just read it. Don't be that's a, abstraction. You shouldn't let the abstraction freezes your mind. <laughs> yes? That's the idea you need to learn. So here, if I read it in words, I would say that I am interested in the collection of all points belonging to P such that the distance from A to O is R. So it means that if I, if, I don't know, if I am going to succeed to define the idea of this very strange circle in this very abstract set, I need to know how to define a distance. Yes? So in other words, you need to tell me what is the distance from book to this? What is the distance from alpha to a star? What is the distance from this smiley face to square root of five, which is already ridic seems ridiculous. So if you would write P, like if in the same way you would write M, would P just be all points on this, every point you can imagine on this thing? Would it be infinitely many? But here, no, there are not infinitely many. No, on, on, P, on P, there are infinitely many. But what is the idea? I want to feel it, relax please a little bit. First of all, are you okay with what I have written here? This is not something hard. You need to practice your brain, respect what you see. You need to learn how to read mathematics, okay? When you see, when I see C-O-R, you ask yourself, what was A? A was not here, so it means that I am putting it by hand. But be careful, you cannot choose B here. This A that appears secondly here is exactly the same A here. So if you want to write the abstract definition in this new setup, you have to respect these kinds of details, which is not hard, by the way. First of all, tell me, are you happy with what I have written on top? Yes or no? But the, the only thing that you should be unhappy with, what does this damn thing mean, yes? Is there a, like, defin can you say that distance is defined as no, that is the point. So what? So let us let us not stray away from the main concept. We are running out of time. But what I'm trying to say is that Rocco mentioned, if I want to make this meaningful, I have a job to do. My job is to make it make an understanding about what is the meaning of distance in this world. Yes. 
this is a very, I think, good example to teach you how to abstract things. Okay, now let us think about it. We want to make a concept of distance. The concept of distance in the world that we are living is very clear. I give you two points and you have a measuring tool, whatever, you measure the distance between them, okay? And that is usually called, that is a spatial dimension, uh, uh, distance. Now I want to do something that I have access to the notion of distance in this kind of a space. This is the abstraction. So if you want to do that, how do you think about it? This is why you have to be very professional in seeing the core of meaning of, idea, uh, of ideas. So you need to think, this is the way mathematicians think. Okay, let us try to think about the distance. Okay, let us, I don't know, take a coffee and just sit down and think about the distance. So this is really what is going on. Okay, and then uh, you try to understand the core of what we mean by distance. And by the way, mathematicians are usually using the ideas around them and try to abstract them out. Okay, so can you tell me what is a distance? No, it, so, so all of you know about this term that I want to use. So what do you do? A distance, I give you two points and then you generate what for me? No, distance. So, for example, I give you two points, okay, and I give you whatever you need, and I ask you to find the distance between these two points for me. When I return back to the classroom, what do you offer to me? A number, okay? But what type of number? Before coming to the classroom, I am sure that you don't put negative five there, yes? No. Do you think that 1.5 is not good? I might come back and you tell me 1.5. Why you are insisting on integers? 1.5. No, non-negative real numbers. You, say, you said non-negative for the people who doesn't appreciate. What is the difference between non-negative and positive? Yes. When we say positive, it means a strictly greater than zero. Non-negative means greater than or equal to zero. Okay. By the way, should I expect that you might be giving me zero? Yeah, but in that is extreme case, if two points lie exactly on top of each other. So I get zero. Okay. Okay. Can you tell me what the distance is at the end? So this, this distance is the output of some process. I give you two points, you do a measurement, you produce a number. What is this called in mathematics? Function, thank you. So that's a function. So, but the function here is higher level than the function that you study in high school. Because what is the main difference between this function that I mentioned, the distance, and the functions that we study in high school? No, there is a no, there is a big dif not big difference. There is another difference between them. And the normal functions in high school, how many inputs you put in, one, and how many outputs you get, one. Yes, but in this case, I cannot put one. I cannot say, okay, find the distance from this point, and then if you don't do that, I give you zero. Okay, this is, you start smiling at me. Yes. Because it is, so it means that you are waiting, okay, what is the other point? So I have to provide you two inputs. And then if you know your job, you produce a number. Okay, is that right? Yes. Okay, by the way, let me give you some symbols, a strange symbol. So let me call, you, so for example, this Euclidean space. The distance, if I call it D, this is a very strange way of writing. In mathematics, people write like this. So they say that D is a function that take this cross product, we will discuss about that later. But this is essentially, this symbol is very, very, so people, I know that in physics department, they start talking a lot of words to avoid the symbol. <laughs> they don't like abstraction that much. But then it, I get confused. I don't understand what they are saying. But as soon as I see this symbol, I know oh, this is this idea. Okay, so that's the difference. Okay, so when I say this one, it means that I get a point 
So it means that every function is a machine, is an operator. So in this case, I send two inputs in. Let us say point A and point B. I send point A in and point B in. And this machine, which is the distance machine, generates what? A number from, for me. And this number is denoted by dA of B in mathematics. Yes? So I sent two points in this machine. I don't know. You can imagine that you have electronic gadget and with two electrodes, somehow sensitive. The gadget is there. I put the electrodes here for some, uh, it is engineered in a way that it immediately connects, uh, it immediately measure the distance between them and the number is there. And then I start playing around. I put the electrodes there, another number comes in. I put the electrodes there, another number comes in. But that's the idea that you need to think. So I send A, I send B to this machine and then a number coming up. That number is DA of B, okay? So DA of B is not the function itself, is the output of the function. The function is this machine here generating that number. Okay, so this is the fancy way of writing that. So this A belongs to the first one, this B belongs to the second one, and the output is a number. So that's the way, instead of drawing a diagram like that, mathematicians write something like this. Okay, and then uh, try to, I will talk about these things extensively if there are still interested the students coming in. Oops, I, I shouldn't forget. I hope that you remember what I wrote here. What was M, do you remember? It was book, alpha, five, and then a star, and then a smiley face, yes? Okay, now, so now let us try to explore, to abstract out the core properties of distance. So tell me whatever you know about the distance. First of all, we, we learn distance is a function, okay? We know. And then we learn something else. For every A and B, this is symbol means for all. We will talk about them extensively. Don't, don't let these things distract you, okay? So for all A and B in the Euclidean space, what can I write? D A of B is a real number, is a real number. What does it mean? It means it belongs to the real numbers. But more than that, D A and B is non-negative. Do you feel it, what I'm writing? Yes? So for all A and B in the Euclidean space, the distance between that pair, whatever they are, is a real number but not negative one. This is one property that we know. Okay, explore. What is the other property of the distance? When you grow up from childhood, it is already implemented in your brain. What is that? Explore, explore please, we don't have that much time. <laughs> I want to say it's like... Yeah, just say it in your own language. It's very simple. Don't try to put it in mathematics. That I will do it for you. When you take a number that this that is a number, you're, you're using some kind of measurement, right? You're defining what this what this distance means, right? In some. But that's a that's a physical problem, okay? But let us try to go back to the world of mathematics. What are the properties of this distance? I'm sure you know. Yes. It can change. No, the distance between two, let us take two points. For these two points, yes? No, distance is not a line. I told you, the distance is this function. It generates a number out of any two points that you put in. Do you understand this picture? It's not hard, by the way. No, try to explore the problem. No, very simple properties. If the distance from me to you is one meter, then? Yes, that's one thing. That's by the way, let us, let us write it down. So let us write it down. If someone tells you that this number is zero, what can you conclude? They are the same points, okay? Don't make things hard, by the way. Abstract mathematics is not making things hard, okay? Some people want to be so precise that they don't know what to write. They are frozen. That's not good. Okay, so do you agree that this is a property? Why didn't you mention this before? So if the distance is A, it indicates that these two points are the same. Is this arrow goes in the other direction as well? Yeah, yeah. If, if you tell me that points A and B are equal, then I understand that the distance between them is zero. That's good. 
So one property, two property. Are you discovering another one? Very, very simple. I just told you, if the distance between me and you is one meter, then the distance between the same. So it means that the function is symmetric. Okay, so this means that property number three, the distance from A to B is the same. What should I write in front? Can you tell me mathematically? Is equal to what? No. D of B and A. The distance from A to B is equal to distance from B to A. These are good, but I don't know if you know about another very essential property. Yes. yes so if the distance from you to here is one is uh, one meter and the distance from here to here is one meter then the distance from me to here is two very meters. good but not complete because that idea is when we are aligned oh okay, okay okay yes but how what happens if we are not on a line you are completely right that is exactly the property that i want to mention uh you know in persian uh, culture donkey is the stupid animal okay and i think in arabic culture is also the same this idea of what i want to say is called donkey theorem meaning that if the donkey understands that let alone human beings yes so what is the meaning it means that if you put the donkey here and the food here and then there is two paths one directly here and one from here and if it's visible to donkey donkey will choose this one so somehow in, in sticking, uh, from instinct, he knows that it knows that actually this is a shorter. This is called triangle inequality. It turns out to be a very fundamental inequality in our universe. Okay. Okay. But let me try. So, so can you express that in the language of abstract mathematics that now you're enjoying? So number four, what can I write? What is the meaning of the triangle inequality? But of course, what Rocco mentioned was from a special case. That a special case is what happens. Three points are the same. So the Ro Rocco mentioned this situation, which was completely right. But this is the general situation. So how can I write it in words? Uh, no, in symbols. So I need to start. So by the way, to be honest, I am not precise here. I would say that I should write, I don't want to distract you, but let me write. This is number two, I should say for all A and B in Euclidean space, if you want to be precise. And here I should do the same thing here, okay? Uh, okay, and number four, can you tell me what will I write? No, you name it, you don't need to me. me. So for example, what is the natural, by the way, it's also good to care about beauty and clearness i can immediately write a b and z that's a strange you what what should i write a b and c okay and then i would write for all for all for all finish it yet a b and c where in the euclidean space okay then is less than d of a to b plus b to c not complete you didn't consider what roku mentioned Unless. less okay. less than or equal because sometimes it is equal so this is something intuitively we understand about distance do you agree this is what we understand about distance okay now i don't think there are other properties that we want to uh, by the way uh, so you need to elaborate i i do i need to put all of them or one of them is a consequence of the other one by the way that's also another role of mathematicians so you shouldn't put too much axioms okay might be i don't know might be this you don't need to put for example assume that you have this you have this you have this it's sometimes possible to automatically conclude this logically okay let us not disturb you but this is probably the things we have so if i have a function in my universe m now that enjoys these properties it is reasonable to call it distance don't resist this is the abstract world because you told me what you expect from a distance function you told me and i wrote it down do you now the abstraction comes here 
A mathematician say that, okay, these are main properties of Euclidean distance we are used to. But let me invent a new concept. Do you remember about the sphere which was coming from roundness? Now, I want to define a new concept coming from this idea, and that is called metric. So you define a metric on any kind of a space if it, that metric enjoys these properties. Yes or no? Yeah? So for example, for example, I want to say, by the way, this session is actually, I don't know why I cleaned this, but uh, in this session, you might, you don't expect yourself to understand everything, okay? Because I will come back and co complete them. I'm just giving you the ideas. So I hope that I wanted to understand that, okay, if I have, if I can construct an artificial function having these properties, it seems reasonable to define it as a distance. Yes, that is what I just wanted to motivate you. Yes. Just want to ask, how do we know that these are all of the properties of distance? Could there be, um, maybe you know, but could this there possibly another? Yeah, that's a good question, but I mean, uh, what else? Uh, I don't know. No, you, no you are right. No. no, 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 be careful. Here I'm not proving something. You might say that, okay, I want to add extra conditions on distance. Okay. Okay. First of all, you need to motivate that extra conditions are working. And they are not consequence of these four. That's what I'm saying. If you put something here that can be deducted logically from the previous ones, mathematicians uh, remove it. Because they don't want to put a lot of uh, 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 things there. And by the way, taking this definition sometimes takes hundreds of years. For example, the definition of what a topology is, it was not immediate to mathematicians. What should we take as the definition so that we are not too strict, that our hands are tied, we cannot budge, or we it is too loose that everything goes there? It's not that easy. But I just want to give you the idea. So now, from now on, I hope that you agree with me that if I can, somehow construct another function, artificial one or whatever, which enjoys these properties, it is reasonable. Look at, the, just take my words. It is reasonable to see it as a distance. Yes? The first conditions can, yeah, it's all real numbers, I guess, but in our world end, what are, what are numbers? There? No, 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 no. R is still there. Don't get confused. A and B are coming from my set. But it is, doesn't mean that I do not have R. Yeah. R is another creature in mathematics living in its own with real numbers and everything. It's still there. And yes? So the notion of R changes the output. Yes? Not the input. You might say that, okay, I want to live in a word that the distance is something natural. You might be able to discover what is going on. Okay, but let me just finish this because I don't think we can finish it. Might be we can also continue. But let me give you a very, a, a very nice function. I define D. Okay, if you don't mind, let me change my symbol to capital D, not to confuse it with this D. Okay, first of all, I want to see how many of you appreciate my notations. Do you understand what does this mean? This means D is a machine, takes a pair from M and M. So it means that D acts from A and B, okay? So that it is equal to zero if A is not equal to B, if A is equal to B, and it is one if A is not equal to B, okay? So I'm just artifacting artificial uh, distance. Now, first of all, can you, can you read these symbols? Because by the way, that's a very important skill. If you want to work in advanced mathematics, you have to be very good in reading symbols and understanding them. So when you see this, what is the meaning of that? How do you view this? This D is a function, so you can imagine it in your head as a machine. How many inputs this machine have? has? Two. But these two inputs are coming from where? 
from here. Yes, both of them are coming from M. And then you send them here. The output, depending on your input, has two values, either zero or one. Okay, it gives you zero if the inputs that you send are equal. It gives you one if they are not equal. This is the way that you need to interpret these symbols. Understandable or not? Yes or no? Okay. But let us check these properties for this artificial function that I described here for you. Okay? Let us try it because there is no time. I, I, want, I don't want to go through details, but let us see. Do you think the first part works? Is the output a real number? Yes, the output is either 0 or 1. It's a real number. Is it a non-negative real number? Yes, because the output is 0 or 1. It's a non-negative number. So property 1 satisfied. Property 2. Do you think that if the distance between two points is 0, I can conclude that A is equal to B? By definition, yes, because the output is 0 under this condition. What about the other way around? If I give you two equal points, can I say the distance between them is 0? Yes, exactly by definition. So con this one is also satisfied. You see, it's very fun, by the way. So the distance between A and B, do you agree it is equal to the distance between B and A? Yeah, because if A and B are equal, then again, B and A are equal. Both of them are 0. If they are not equal, this one is 1. That one is also 1. OK, so the tricky part is to check the last one. OK, but let, us, let me skip this one. I will come back to it if we have time. Otherwise, in the next session. So trust me on that. This will also work here. By the way, that's, an exact, that's a good exercise. It's a very, very simple exercise. I want you to convince yourself that this is also true. So then I artifacted the distance. And this is called a metric on M. Yes, the outputs are distance, but in this strange world, there are two types of numbers that I can expect, either 0 or 1. But who cares? And by the way, you shouldn't resist about your theory. Remember Einstein, yes? So if it is predicting something, it's predicting, okay? It might be useless in the world of physics, but it is still useful in mathematics. So this is something I want to put an exercise for today, by the way, that's good. Try to convince yourself that it's true for this one. And then we are convinced that it's a metric. And let us go back to our circle. By the way, what is my circle? So what was the circle we were discovering? It was the smiley face, and it was one, OK? Can I talk about circle in this space now? I couldn't do it before, but now I can because I have the distance. Yes, I have my distance. So what happens? This becomes, do you remember? How many of you remember the definition? By the way, definition is not something you memorize because you have an idea. Whenever you ask me what is the circle, it's still I am a human. I go back to my normal life and visualize the circle and write the definition. A belongs to where? Here. M in this case because my space is M. And such that the distance here is D from, from A to a smiley face is is. One, R in this case is one, yes? And what is left to interpret this and write it down? Can you tell me what is that? I am interested in all elements coming from set M such that the distance in this interpretation of that point to the smiley face is one. By the way, people who are working in computer science, they should be very good in reading these things. It's not hard. By the way, it's very, very close to uh, computer science. Okay? So, so what do you think I should write in front of it? Okay, let us check. Because as, uh, this is good. This, there are only finitely many. Do you think book belongs to this set? Let us check. Book belongs to M or not? Yes, so far so good. But I need to check another thing. Is the distance from book to a smiley face one? Yes or no? By definition, yes, because book and a smiley face are not equal. They are not the same objects. So the distance between them by definition is one. 
So book goes there. Yes? And now, let us check. Do you think alpha goes there? Alpha goes there with the same reason. Yes? And then, square root of 5 goes there. Star goes there. Smiley face goes there. It's very strange. Yes? Okay? And then, what is this one called? What is this? The set M itself. Okay? Congratulations. Your circle is the whole space. Yeah? So our entire space is a circle. Yeah. Ah, yes. Thank you very much. It's not there, by the way. Thank you. So it's very... Is, is a smiley face there? Because if a smiley face, the distance between a smiley face and a smiley face is zero, and zero is not one. So thank you very, very much. I was spoiling everything. So it's not M. It's this one. Yeah, the circle of the circle is not there. And by the way, intuitively, it is correct. That was the, exactly what I said. You remember when I told you this is a circle, I told you that this center, we always put it, but center is not in the circle itself. So enjoy your circle. So this is a circle. So now you understand what is abstract art. <laughs> I don't know what is in the brain of the painter when you go and see this painter that this is a person. Okay? Exactly like as this is a circle. And it's not funny. I try to convince you that this is a circle. Okay, let me let me uh, finalize that. Is that clear for everyone? Okay, let me increase the increase the radius. Let me try to test your understanding. The circle with the same center smiley face, but radius two. No, tell something mathematically rigorous. This what you said is the idea, and I totally agree with you. What is the answer? So you oh, so I want to write the circle with the smiley face and center and the radius too you open your bag you're supposed to put things in okay but which one i can put to what which one of these i can put to in can i put something in no because the output is either zero and one it cannot be equal to two so i open the bag hoping that i have something i get disappointed i close the bag yes and this bag is famous in mathematics it's called the empty set it is very strange, yes? <laughs> it means that if you draw a circle with the smiley face radius 2, there is no circle in that world like that. Yes? Okay? But, but our fourth condition, you just said it's true. This, this doesn't... No, this has to be true. Otherwise, I'm not allowed to call it. A... So don't get confused. First, I try to convince you this artificial function that I described follows everything that I say here okay and then I use that idea of the distance and I uh, construct my circle okay and then in mathematics later I don't know how much we can go in this lesson and then this set equipped with this D together is called a metric space so a metric space is a set in which we can talk about how far or how close points are using the metric that we have artificially constructed or whatever. Is that clear? Before ending this one minute, I want you to explore. There is no time. Can I apply, can I apply the same metric on Euclidean space? So let me call it, uh, I don't know, curly D from Euclidean space multiplied by Euclidean space to R. Exactly the same definition. Yeah, if you want to. Because I told you that you need to have a set, you need to have a metric, and then you combine them, then suddenly you have a metric space. And you can start measuring distances. Okay? I think it would be a good idea if I continue a little bit about this next time. But your homework is to confirm yourself that this important inequality which is called the triangle inequality is satisfied for this metric that i just introduced okay and because in r like in the domain r one plus one is still equal to two right like that just m doesn't change that uh yes so here 
Uh, now, the, the, the second question is that apply the same metric, but on Euclidean space and try to discover what is the meaning of, I don't know, circle or whatever. Okay. And then I think before going, because my goal is to go to the, I will talk a little bit more about these concepts next time. And then I will jump into the topic of logic. Okay. I didn't talk about logic today. I, I, I forgot to appropriate a little bit, but then. After logic, we want to go to set theory. I don't know how long this will take, but it takes a long time. And of course, it depends how much you are interested in these things. Okay, any questions? Okay, thank you very much.